Namaskar, everyone. A very, very good evening and very, very warm welcome. Uh, we are very delighted to have with us Dr. Rajan Kumar, all the way from New Delhi. And uh, he's a very special guest because he'll be speaking about something which is very, very contemporary. In fact, as we do this conversation, a theater of war has already been in existence for some time uh, in Europe now. And we are aware of the circumstances and the bylines which are happening uh, uh, in, in Europe. And we are very happy to bring you an expert uh, who teaches uh, Russian history, who teaches Russian and Central Asian international relations and geopolitics, and is deeply involved, also is a writer. He writes prolifically, uh, speaks about it on various platforms. Of course, I'll be introducing him formally. But Dr. Rajan Kumar, for being here with us on this platform, I'm extremely grateful to you, deeply humbled and truly honored to have you amongst us to speak to us about the Russian-Ukraine relationships from historical perspective to the current crises. So thank you very much for being with us. Would you like to say thank something? You, uh, uh, thank you so much, Mukda. I'm uh, delighted. It's my privilege and honor. Actually, you know, I should be honored for, that you are inviting me here. And uh, yeah, and the topic is very contemporary. So we'll talk about uh, Russia-Ukraine relationship. And I'll try to give a broad overview from the historical period till the present crisis. So thank you, Mukda. And I would also like to thank the Literary Society of uh, IS Association, Rajasthan. So I'm extremely grateful to the entire team and also Yogesh Ji, uh, apart from Mukda. And thank you, audience. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. And we hope to have a very good conversation on this topic. Thank you. Yeah, so, so thank you very much, Rajan. Once again, very, very warmly welcoming you. And I also like to very warmly welcome our very, very uh, dedicated and discerning audience who have joined us today. And the audience, as we all know, compromi uh, comprises of not just the civil servants, but also members drawn from uh, the civil society, because the idea of this platform is to be a bridge through dialogue and meaningful conversation between the civil service and the civil society. And uh, that has always been our uh, uh, you know, uh, purpose uh, to bridge the gap, even if that gap exists only in perception. And I see some friends of yours uh, and ours have also joined the conversation. So very, very warmly welcoming all our very, very discerning audiences. And just for the benefit of all those people who are joining this platform for the first time, I'm very happy to tell you that we have been in existence for the last four years. We have done more than 56 sessions. Uh, this is our uh, 58th uh, session. So very, very happy uh, uh, to be doing so many sessions. And this can only happen with the support of wonderful authors and speakers and, of course, the audience. So without taking much of your time, because we have an hour and a half to wind up this conversation, uh, let me begin, first of all, by introducing our uh, author and speaker. Dr. Rajan Kumar teaches in the School of International Studies, SIS, at JNU, New Delhi. His latest book, Re-Emerging Russia, was published by Palgrave Macmillan. He writes regularly for the Financial Times and other newspapers on issues of international politics and India's foreign relations. Uh, his first book uh, spoke about conflict resolution, a study of Chechnya. He has also studied and taught in the University of Kentucky, Lexington, USA. He has also lived and taught in Moscow for a brief period. He is right now the associate professor at the Center for Russian and Central Asian Studies. Uh, at SIS in JNU, New Delhi. And with, with that very brief introduction, I will now invite uh, Rajan uh, and ask him, uh, you know, uh, this entire thing which is going on deserves a lot of attention because every story that is happening in the current times has a backstory. Uh, so I'd like you uh, to take us right into history, deep down into history, because very recently, I think it's The Economist which which has come up with a cover page which says that uh, the Stalinization of uh, uh, you know Russia is happening right now. Yeah. Uh, so that's the latest that I saw. So um, uh, Rajan, how do you propose to do this? Do you propose to speak or do you propose to show us a presentation? Yeah. So, uh, so what I'm planning to do, Mukta, thank you, Mukta. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, what I plan to do is that I'll give, uh, say, 15 to 20 minutes kind of uh, PPT slide uh, because I want to show some maps and also some of the historical facts so I can share in the slide, and after that we can have a longish uh, Q and A. 
uh, with you of course and also with the audience and as you as you said uh, we can be bilingual so that's fine i can speak english and hindi both yes yeah. so while rajan while rajan is uh, doing his ppt sharing uh, for the benefit of the audience i just want to let everybody know as rajan has already told you that uh, please feel free to ask your questions in english or hindi we will try and keep the conversation partly in english and partly in hindi for wider outreach and uh, i'll be really grateful if people can start their start putting down the questions because we have limited time today rajan is here for a very limited time he's been broached by a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, the print and the electronic media to give talks on this topic so his time is very precious for us so i would really request everybody to start writing their questions so we can pick as many questions as possible after the presentation is over and rajan of course will be talking of issues principal actors timelines chronology uh, what it portends for the future how the maps look how geography plays a role and uh, so much more we'll ask him through the questions after his presentation rajan the floor is all yours now all right uh, thank you so much mukda you are always generous uh, in introduction with uh, your speaker so let me share the slide here and uh, and if you can see can you see the slide here mukda can you see just confirm once yes i can see yes all right this lovely yeah all right yeah so lovely uh, so these are the broader issues that i'll be talking about today uh, uh, crisis most of you know uh, you have been reading newspapers you have been following in the print and electronic media so i'll not get into too much of uh, contemporary details i want to bring in uh, something new on the table and i'll try to give a complexity which has emerged uh, from the history and is not just confined to the last uh, few years so i'll try to give you a historical background uh, i'll also try to explain uh, some of the motives of the key actors which are involved in this conflict and uh, what is the grand strategy that million dollar question that all of you have in your mind that what is the strategy of uh, president putin and where is russia going to stop so what is the what is the plan so i'll i'll make a few speculation of course nobody knows about uh, his plan but yes i'll try to make a few uh, hypotheses I'll, i'll throw a few hypotheses for your consideration and then finally uh, depending on time we can talk about the crisis uh, resolution uh, in case uh, there is one uh, so uh, uh, if i have to explain the crisis uh, in as, a, as an academic as a, as a person who has been involved in this issue on in, in this country or on this issue for the last uh, 15 to 20 years uh, so uh, what i see there are structural fault lines which exist uh, between russia and the west Uh, and the dichotomy i'll explain you in the uh, slides to come that uh, russia uh, always wanted to become one of the normal countries of the west but unfortunately the west never accepted uh, as a part, uh, russia as a part of the west uh, in 1990s if you see the policies of uh, yeltsin the previous president uh, he wanted russia to become a normal western country he wanted to establish democracy but ultimately i you know the, probably the west uh, failed to accommodate russian interest uh, in the west and russia started feeling very very humiliated and as a consequence what you see that we uh, you know uh, they have reached a point where there is there seems to be no uh, no uh, silver lining uh, so uh, uh, russia west dichotomy is one of the fault lines which has defined uh, ukraine russia and the western relationship for a very very long time uh, also what i see that you know there is a security dilemma and security dilemma means not just the security threat but also how you perceive the threat and what i see that both western countries the way they fear about russia and the way russia fears the western country so that has created a security dilemma and if you have this dilemma no matter how uh, strong you make your security the dilemma is going to exist and it it leads to arm arms race and you know uh, uh, this rearmament more budgets for military and secu- security a uh, militarization of the country also so all of that is happening uh, not only in russia but also in the western country for the last few years uh, and uh, this crisis in ukraine is also an outcome of the core of the, the clash of identity the clash of identity you have ukrainian identity you have russian identity you have cris, uh, cross cutting identity uh, in ukraine as well as in russia and also uh, in the eastern european countries uh, but uh, the core identity which defines uh, both, uh, russia and ukraine uh, they identify themselves with the slavic identity and orthodox christianity i'll come to that later but also competitive nationalism uh, that you see in russia on the one hand but also in ukraine you have several nationalisms not just ukrainian nationalism but also that is countered by 
by by the Polish nationalism or uh, for for instance the the Russian nationalism, Russian who live in the eastern part of Ukraine. And I'll show you in a map uh, very quickly. A regime change policy uh, attempted by the West and now being attempted by 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 Russia, uh, President Putin. So that is that also has created a the present crisis. Uh, Unfortunately, you know, uh, the one at a larger level, at a larger uh, geopolitical level, at the systemic level, a uh, global system, uh, U.S. Uh, has not been able to accept uh, the rise of the powers uh, in the regions, whether it's Eurasia, where Russia is the most important power, or uh, China, which is the most imp important power in East Asia. Uh, for that matter, India also. India is almost a regional power. Is a hegemon uh, in South Asia and Brazil in Latin America. So there are several regional powers which have emerged in the last 20, 30 years. But US is finding it difficult to accept that uh, you know that is hegemony. Hegemony is not having that kind of influence the way it had in the 1990s and also uh, the first decade of the century, where they could have they could attack uh, Iraq, they could attack Syria, Libya. Uh, uh, Yugoslavia. So all that is not happening now. U.S. has practically withdrawn from a large part of Asia. Uh, U.S. is now uh, it, U.S. will find it very difficult to operate in Eurasia. Uh, it will find difficult to operate in Africa also because the way China, India, and other countries are entering into Africa and also in Latin America. So U.S. influence is declining, but U.S. is not able to come to terms with multipolar kind of world uh, which is emerging. U.S. remains the, the most important part. There is absolutely no uh, second thought about it but us has to accept that there are other regional parts which have emerged and us must accept it uh, so those are the structural issues at the you know systemic level at the global uh, geopolitical level but also there are a few precipitating causes what you call immediate factors immediate causes uh, of this conflict and uh, the most important of course in my view uh, is the nato expansion and the proxy war uh, which was going on in Ukraine for the last 10-15 uh, years uh, and uh, after 2014 it was a proxy war between NATO and Russia uh, in uh, different uh, territories of Ukraine so that is one of the most important reasons and also I believe that somehow uh, Pre President Putin uh, also uh, his kind of hubris you call it or a kind of miscalculation where he probably thought that he can easily redraw the map of a map of Ukraine or Europe or what he calls uh, Russian security. So uh, uh, he probably expected that he'll uh, he'll uh, do a bridge creek bridge creek kind of a strike uh, immediately go there in the next uh, in, the, in a week or so he'll uh, capture uh, Kiev and come back. Unfortunately, that has not happened, uh, and uh, the crisis might linger for several weeks and maybe months. Also, we don't know. Uh, Biden administration also uh, wanted to escalate the crisis uh, uh, initially uh, and uh, to a certain to a certain extent. Uh, there are two three reasons why Biden administration wanted to escalate. Uh, first, because NATO uh, during the previous administration, which was Trump uh, administration, was in disarray. Uh, French President Macron said that uh, NATO is a dying institution, and many of the people started believing in that. And France, uh, Turkey. Uh, 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 Germany, all these countries started having a kind of started thinking of European security, which would be different from uh, the NATO provided security, and they started having relationship with Russia. And uh, uh, United States got really, really scared uh, scared about this kind of development. In fact, if you see the U American policies in Europe, is not just to contain Russia. European policy in uh, uh, sorry, uh, American policy in Europe is, uh, are uh, twofold. One is to contain Russia, but second is also to keep Germany down. The uh, U.S. would never like Germany to become a very powerful independent military state. Uh, so uh, to co contain Germany also, NATO has to be the powerful institution. Only that way, uh, United States can keep a control uh, on European uh, uh, security architecture. So that is one of the reasons. And uh, there are some economic reasons. Nord Stream 2 pipeline, I'll show you the map in a second in, 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 the, in the slides to come but that is also one reason because uh, with the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline from directly from Russia to uh, to Germany uh, Russia could have bypassed Belarus and Ukraine the two two countries uh, through which the traditional pipelines of Russia uh, pass and connect uh, Russia with uh, European countries and as you know European countries are largely dependent on uh, oil and gas supplies from uh, from from Russia uh, 30 to 35 percent average, but some of the countries have 80 percent, 90 percent. Germany has roughly 40 percent of gas uh, coming from Russia. And of course, the, the opportune time was provided by the withdrawal of uh, army, uh, NATO army from Afghanistan, because Russia thought probably that this is the right time to intervene, uh, because U.S. will never uh, send its troops troops on the ground and uh, if it doesn't send its troops on the ground there's no way russia can uh, come under pressure 
of NATO. So these are the broader regions, uh, structural factors and the uh, immediate uh, causes of the crisis. Uh, now, how do you make sense of Russia? And I always, I love saying this statement, I love giving this statement in my uh, all presentations. Uh, but in fact, uh, you know, the Winston Churchill in 1939, he made a remark just before the World War II, uh, that if you want to understand Russia, uh, so uh, Russia, according to him, is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. So uh, it's very, very difficult. There are so many layers of Russian security or the way Russians uh, think about the West. So it's very difficult uh, to make sense of what Russia is actually planning. But he also said that the key to understand uh, key to understand Russia is national interest. So if you want to make sense of Russia, you have to understand what is the security and the national interest of Russia. But also the problem is that national interest will not be that helpful because uh, it's not a static concept. It, it keeps evolving. And Putin himself, if you see last uh, just one month, so Putin's uh, goalpost has shifted. You know, initially he wanted some kind of autonomy for Donbas. Now. Uh, he wants a recognition as an independent state and now uh, uh, Russian army is in Kiev. So you don't really know that, you know, uh, that what is the national interest. And so that keeps evolving, that keeps changing. So national interest is a very ambiguous concept for any country and it's always a changing concept. But uh, what we need to understand historically uh, is the Russian identity. And Russian identity is a split uh, between uh, a split among uh, Westernizers, uh, the people in Russia who want Russia to become a part of the West, and Slavophile, because Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, all of them identify themselves as Slavic countries, apart from Serbia and there are other countries also uh, in Europe. But these are the core countries which identify themselves as Slavic states. So some of the people identify in Russia even today. Uh, with that core traditional historic identity uh, of, of Slavic identity. But uh, Putin, uh, because you know, the uh, Russia it never was accepted uh, in the historical period or even today as part of the West. Uh, so Russia uh, also has started thinking of a, of a distinct identity, uh, which is Eurasian identity. So Eurasian means, you know, it's not the part of the West, it's not the part of Europe, and it's not the part of Asia. So uh, it's an Eurasian identity, which gives a distinct identity, but it's used more like an instrument uh, that, you know, which can be argued that Russia is a part of the East, depending on if it wants to have an alliance with China. So it will argue that Russia is a part of the part of the East. If it wants to have an alliance with Germany, so it can argue that it's a part of the West. So Eurasian identity is a very fuzzy identity, but it is used as an instrument by, uh, by President Putin and a number of other scholars uh, in, in, in Russia. Now, uh, Historically, the three elements which have defined uh, Russia as a nation, uh, if, if somebody asks you what is the basis of uh, Russian identity, so normally you will find that a lot of people, uh, Henry Kissinger and a lot of other people have argued that Russian identity or Russian and the basis of Russian identity uh, can be uh, identified as orthodoxy. Orthodoxy doesn't mean orthodox as a term, uh, it refers to orthodox Christianity. So, uh, because I, I'll come to that in a, in a minute. Uh, so, Orthodox Christianity defines the Russian, and this Orthodox Christianity in Russia is different from uh, the Catholic uh, identity that you have in either uh, the Eastern part of Europe or uh, the Protestant, which you have in the Western part of Europe. So, they identify, Russians identify themselves as distinct or, and different, and that Orthodox Christianity. And autocracy or authoritarianism, uh, that has been defining feature of Russia in the Jarist period. Uh, even during the Soviet period, as you know, the kind of policies that Stalin pursued, so he was very autocratic or he was very authoritarian, uh, so or dictatorial, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so autocracy is another feature uh, which defines Russian identity. And of course, because Jarist identity survived for five, 400, 500 years, a continuous regime of, the, of Jar. So nationalism has remained an important aspect of of, of uh, Russian identity. And even during the Soviet Union, which talks, talked of you know, pro, pro, this uh, uh, that uh, socialism or uh, in, uh, international socialism, etc. But even then, uh, the way they, they kind of uh, created the republics, the 15 republics, they were based on uh, some kind of linguistic nationalism. So nationalism has remained a defining feature. And uh, what uh, uh, President Putin is following today, he is following the uh, the hyper nationalism where he wants to secure Russia forever, although that never happens, but that's what uh, his plan is. Uh, territorially, uh, one of the reasons why military has remained a very strong element in Russian politics and in Russian society, because uh, Russian geography is very, very vulnerable. 
uh, Russia is surrounded on the one side by China and you know Russia had traditionally war with China it had war with Japan also and it was defeated also uh, on the one side on the southern side traditionally Russia used to have the the Iranian of the Persian Empire very powerful empire the British Empire in India and also Ottoman Empire which remained till World War one and on the western side it has a very powerful uh, you know uh, force of the Western European country right from uh, Hitler before that Napoleon etc uh, so uh, Russia always feels very vulnerable Russia's population is very low but it has to and it mostly you know most of the areas are landlocked so Russia needs a very strong army and Russia needs a strong buffer states to protect its territory otherwise there is a fear there is a fear that these countries might uh, encroach into the territories of Russia so Russia feels very, very vulnerable and militarization as a consequence uh, it has always remained one of the important features of uh, Russia. Uh, if I have to tell you the, you know, the kind of uh, complex relationship that Russia has with the West, the dichotomy that I referred to in the beginning. So uh, I'm quoting here Isaiah Berlin, the famous political philosopher. He says that on the one hand, uh, you know, uh, he says that how Russia thinks of the West. Uh, so on the one hand, there is an intellectual respect, envy, admiration, and desire to emulate and excel and on the other hand emotional hostility suspicion and contempt a sense of clumsy detrop of being outsider uh, leading as a result to an alter alteration between excessive self prostration before and aggressive flouting of western values so you know uh, this also actually in a way defines uh, the way india has its relationship with the west because we also and we admire and have desired to emulate the Western ideas and technology, but also we think that West is degenerated. The West is Western values cannot be applied to the Indian context. So similarly, Russia also has that kind of contradiction when it comes to understanding the value system there. Uh, the, in the last, uh, very briefly, the three broad phases, the way Russian foreign policy has evolved. So the first phase, 1991 to 95, when Yeltsin was the president of Russia, and uh, just after the disintegration of the Soviet Union, so Yeltsin followed a blind uh, pro-Western policy. And he wanted, as I told you, that he in Russia became the member of IMF, World Bank, etc. And Russia wanted to emulate West. Russia wanted to become a normal Western country. So that was the policy uh, which was followed by Yeltsin. But unfortunately, it led to a massive economic crisis. And Russia was humiliated by the Western countries. Most of the economic policies and the entire policy of privatization was controlled by the Western economists from Howard, uh, Jeffrey Sachs, etc. They were the ones who were controlling the policy of Russia in that time. So that period later on today, uh, if you talk to experts uh, or, or, or people there, so they consider that period to be a period of humiliation. And there was a massive unemployment. A ruble uh, crashed. The, the, the value of ruble, which is earlier almost equivalent to dollar earlier, so that crashed immediately. And you know, uh, it, people uh, had had to undergo a lot of suffering during that period. And most of the people uh, do, uh, they reject that period partly because uh, that was a period of crisis, chaos, and a lot of privatization. And that was a period most of the oligarchs that you see uh, because uh, most of the socialist control and state control industries they were sold. Uh, to the uh, to the private people and private people didn't have money so just imagine how people who had no money no private property suddenly they started buying industries they started buying uh, you know this uh, this uh, state industries and that period led to the emergence of a lot of oligarchs unfortunately the west consider considers that period to the best period of democracy but if you talk to Russian and also as an independent expert, I can tell you. So that was the worst period for Russia. And what Putin is doing today is in a way he's reacting uh, to that kind of policy uh, which was pursued in that period uh, from 1991 to 95. Uh, Elsin was uh, uh, from the period 1991 till 99. And after that, Putin comes uh, comes into picture. And Putin was the was the was the person president who was chosen first as a prime minister. He was chosen by uh, by 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 Yeltsin. Uh, so, uh, so the next next phase is Eurasianism and search for multipolarity. Russia started realizing that the West, uh, the kind of expectation that it had from the West, investment technology, that NATO will not expand, that uh, that NATO will not deploy its army near the border of Russia, none of that happened, and they started feeling humiliated. And um, um, Russia was start, Russia began to be treated as a third rate power, and people in United States started saying that Russia is nothing but a, a petro gas station. Uh, petrol pump so you know it supplies gas to the country beyond that Russia is not so that kind of argument started coming from uh, from the western countries and they started ignoring the interest of uh, of Russia despite a lot of protest from uh, Russian uh, politicians so that was the period of Eurasianism and search for multipolarity 
and that is the period when uh, russia india rick uh, you know you might have heard of the rick and also that has started emerging uh, during that period also brics uh, comes later in 2009 2006 to 2009 period so that was the period when russia started searching for uh, some kind of multipolarity where uh, the west was not considered the prime uh, target of its foreign policy but the but the other countries were taken into account china became the most important pivot of that multipolarity and the eurasianism uh, crossing the rubicon the third phase began after the munich uh, conference munich security conference where uh, uh, president putin uh, he kind of uh, dropped his, all his guards and he blamed the united states for the for a uh, crisis in europe the security problems that uh, russia had with europe so uh, 2007 afterwards i uh, used the phrase crossing the rubicon where russia started intervening directly and indirectly into uh, other countries first it started in georgia uh, and after that uh, it is uh, it intervened in crimea then syria in 2015 16 and then what you see uh, in ukraine today so uh, that is a period of uh, crossing the rubicon and uh, assertiveness of russian foreign policy uh, in, in in international politics uh, here uh, i would like you to see the map here Uh, the, the the on the eastern side of the map what you see the the red one and the pink one so these are the areas where a uh, russian population russian speaking population who identify themselves as russian so they are very very powerful uh, they, they are very dominant in terms of number in terms of uh, in terms of uh, per capita income also and these are the areas which are industrialized also most of the industries of ukraine are located in this area and these industries as you know uh, they were established by the soviet union so and as a consequence because a lot of people started working in the industry so a lot of people migrated from russia uh, to this part of ukraine and even today uh, this this part has a majority of russian population uh, on the blue side that you have uh, that where kiev is located kiev so that is uh, where ukrainian speaking population but ukrainian identity is also very very complex because you know you have people uh, most of the people uh, 70 uh, 80% people they understand a uh, russian language uh, because you know the origin of ukrainian russian language has been very uh, from the same root so they understand the language and uh, the orthodox christianity is another thing which is common in both the areas and russia as a, a state that has emerged not from moscow not from st petersburg and i'll tell you it has how it has emerged from kiev kiev was the center of the origin of russian identity uh, here you know uh, the, just to give you a background that how uh, ukraine as a state was created by when, when uh, different parts of ukraine uh, you know were ad added by different rulers uh, as you can see in 1654 uh, a small very small uh, territory uh, the orange color that you see in the middle so that was uh, just the territory of ukraine in 1654 uh, and in uh, then major part was added in between 1654 to 97 by different jarist rulers and the yellow part that you see uh, they were added in that period uh, in 1939 to 45 after the world war 2 the what you call lviv where most of the refugees are today and that 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 is the area which connects uh, ukraine to poland romania etc uh, so that area was again uh, this uh, uh, stalin and then uh, 1922 earlier the the blue area that you see that was added by an uh, by vladimir uh, lenin the first uh, ruler of uh, russia nikita khrushchev uh, the the famous uh, ruler of uh, soviet union so he also the crimea initially was not part of ukraine crimea was always a part of russia but you know in the soviet union it was just an administrative change so nikita khrushchev in 1954 uh, took away that uh, small territory from the republic of russia and it added to uh, to ukraine so and that is why russian claim that you uh, that crimea has always been part of russia and it was a historical mistake committed by the soviet rulers and uh, if you see the uh, see the image here uh, this is this is the guy called uh, varangan rudik and 1862 ad and this kievan kievan rus uh, rus it was established by this person this rudik and he is the founder of that what he call russia today so the russian state didn't emerge in moscow or st petersburg russian state actually emerged in kiev kiev is the capital of ukraine so uh, and uh, it uh, ruled uh, for 3 400 years but uh, uh, but because of the you know the nature of politics there it was always claimed by different uh, powers especially lithuanian empire the polish empire the ottoman empire austro-hungarian and also russian 
so ukraine has always traditionally been part uh, which has been contested by different historical uh, dynasties and empires uh, kievan rus was incorporated into grand duchy of lithuania and eventually into the polish lithuanian commonwealth in 1569 uh, russia grew its influence in ukraine after 1654 and there was a famous uh, agreement uh, between the ukrainian ruler and and the russian ruler which is known as perislav agreement uh, 1654 uh, remember this date 1654 because exactly after 300 years uh, Khrushchev uh, transferred uh, that uh, Crimea from uh, uh, from Russia to Ukraine to celebrate that 300 years. Uh, so the Russian thought that you know that was a historical mistake and Russia kind of annexed it in uh, 2014. And uh, so what I'm trying to say here is that Ukrainian identity is a very complex multicultural kind of identity and it has traditionally historically been a part of different empires in different period. But by and large, the majority of the territory of ukraine has remained with russia historically and uh, ukrainians are often referred to as a uh, little russian by the russian people and uh, as i told you that uh, that orthodox christianity is one of the defining features of uh, russian identity but also ukrainian identity most of the people in ukraine they identify themselves with Uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, orthodox christianity and later on you, you can ask me questions on orthodox christianity but for the time being remember that ukraine also as a term means borderland borderland of what borderland uh, that means western borderland of russian empire so ukraine as a term is also the borderland of russian empire. so these are the reasons why uh, russia actually claims historically that ukraine has always been a part of a uh, russian empire and ukraine uh, you know russia is willing to accept the sovereignty of ukraine but russia is not willing to accept that ukraine become a part of nato or ukraine is used uh, by nato uh, to contain russia so that's all the conflict is all about from the russian perspective uh, russia uh, yeah so these are the, this is the historical parts so i'm not getting into this now the genesis of the crisis uh, 2014 uh so that has started in 2013 when uh, yanukovych was the leader and he signed an agreement with european union for the economic part eastern partnership agreement that's what it is called so eastern economic partnership agreement was uh, a kind of agreement which could have taken place between ukraine and european union and european union claimed that uh, ukraine is a, as a sovereign state uh, it has uh, it can decide its fate it can decide its sovereignty and it, ca- it should not come under any pressure Uh, russia offered a better deal russia offered a deal russia offered 15 billion dollars of loan uh, russia also put pressure of course politically at on yanukovych to not sign that deal and and stated uh, that ukraine should become a part of eurasian economic union uh, eurasian economic union you have russia kazakhstan uh, 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 other countries also so russia russia wanted uh, ukraine to become a part of eurasian union and not the european union so uh, but uh, so yanukovych uh, decided finally not to sign agreement with european union and as a consequence there was a protest and that protest what happened in euromaidan is called a euromaidan protest in ukraine uh, so that protest was widely supported by uh, civil societies uh, which were being funded by european countries which were also being funded by uh, some of the american um, by american uh, other states so that became a very controversial uh, kind of protest and after that yanukovych had to flee Uh, he had to flee from uh, ukraine to uh, to russia and that is considered the genesis of the crisis and after that uh, russia decided to uh, annex uh, crimea and uh, the term used is not annex russia said it reincorporated uh, crimea because the crimea according to them was part of always a part of russian uh, empire and, and uh, as you can see the figure here uh, russia was ruled by a famous ruler called catherine the great and she is the one who actually uh, Uh, captured crimea from the ottoman empire ottoman was the turkish empire and ottoman empire was a very powerful empire which survived for several hundred years until the first world war uh, so uh, catherine the great she captured the crimea uh, region from uh, ottoman empire uh, L- russia lost the crimea war in 1850s so early uh, later subsequently it became the part of the soviet russia in 2000 uh, 1921 as an autonomous socialist a republic in 1954 i told you the history uh, one of the claims uh, which is uh, made russia uh, is on the southern part of ukraine uh, which it calls novo russia and novo russia uh, why that novo russia because the the reason that region of ukraine was uh, uh, primarily captured by the russian ruler and uh, the russian population you will find in that region more in that region so that region uh, russia claims to be uh, traditionally part of the russian uh, empire and the russian system so from moscow's moscow's perspective this annexation of crimea was presented as a correction of historical mistake 
and that's how they uh, kind of uh, argue it. Uh, Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, he wrote an article which is available on the net, uh, and that gives a good perspective of how Russian uh, or you know, Russia thinks of Ukraine today. Uh, everything is fine. Uh, he claims that uh, Russia and Ukraine had a common origin. Uh, Russia and Ukraine they 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 follow the common Orthodox faith. Saint Vladimir uh, was the you know the person who actually brought Christianity. So it's the same person uh, revered by uh, by by Ukrainian and also by Russian. So uh, he was the prince of both uh, Kiev and Novgorod. So uh, because of those reasons, uh, Russia finds it difficult that Ukraine, uh, which has traditionally been part of Russia, now become becoming the part of the West. So uh, that becomes very very difficult for Russian, uh, you know, Russian uh, leaders to accept that. Uh, so uh, he wrote in that article, and uh, you may not agree with that because he said that true sovereignty of Ukraine is possible only in partnership with Russia. You, and he also said that you know because Donbas region etc was not being given uh, the autonomy uh, which was promised by the Minsk II agreement which was happening between Ukraine, Russia, uh, Germany and France. Uh, so because of that uh, uh, he uh, Putin thinks Putin probably uh, Putin thinks that you know Donbas region which is Russian dominated so they should have been given the autonomy but that was not given and that has created a kind of crisis uh, in uh, between uh, Ukraine and Russia. Uh, one of the things that you need to know, uh, is that because that, that's uh, being discussed all, all the time, is the NATO expansion. Uh, if you see the Cold War period from uh, 1951 to 1991, you know, there were three, four countries which became part of NATO. Uh, but if you see the post-Cold uh, War period, after the disintegration of the Soviet Union, NATO expanded, in, it was a big bang expansion of NATO. And NATO, in 2000, as you can see in the figure, in 1999, uh, Czechoslovakia and uh, and Hungary became the member uh, in 2004 uh, Slovakia then uh, Bulgaria Romania then uh, uh, Slovenia and uh, the Baltic state Estonia Latvia Lithuania so all these states uh, uh, many, in many of the states like in you know, the Baltic states they are they were part of the Soviet Union then they were republics then they become independent nations so they were included in NATO so Russia started thinking that you know the kind of promise which was made by the West so that has never been uh, you know followed or pursued by the West but West never agreed to that uh, agreement which was made in 1994 there were different agreement uh, Budapest Bucharest, uh, Bucharest etc so uh, West according to uh, from Moscow's perspective West did not follow the commitment that it made to Russia so uh, it has started expanding and now it wants to in include Ukraine and Georgia. The two uh, republics which are left, Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova, they are the three ones which, were, which are left on that side uh, and NATO wants to include all these three states. And as a consequence, Russia is uh, you know, feeling very, very threatened uh, because of NATO expansion. Uh, the pipeline that you need to know, uh, this is very important uh, you know, aspect of this conflict. Uh, on the top of it that you see, uh, you know uh, this one uh, which the top line which is uh, maroon and red kind of line which connects st petersburg with germany so what russia and germany did that they because ukraine was in a crisis for the last 10 years so russia and germany decided that uh, instead of having a pipeline through ukraine or through belarus which was the which were the traditional pipelines russia decided that it will have a direct pipeline from st petersburg uh, going through the baltic sea as you can see uh, uh, to germany and it could have connected not just to germany but also to other countries uh, so germany uh, so that became a real threat uh, united states started thinking and many other european countries also started thinking that if that happens uh, germany will become completely dependent on supply of gas from uh, from russia and even though uh, even today is it supplies russia supplies nearly 30 to 35 percent of the gas uh, to germany but dependence would have increased had this pipeline uh, succeeded and this pipeline was about to be completed and also because as i told you that the united states wanted the biden administration had lost its credibility in afghanistan so it wanted to revive its uh, foreign policy uh, you know uh, instrument nato and it wanted to give a rationale and justification to nato and it thought that uh, you know uh, that if there is some escalation of the conflict, so probably you know NATO uh, can get a new uh, justification and new rationale. Uh, so that uh, that uh, those were the plans which actually US uh, uh, pursued in the last uh, few months. Uh, so US did not want Germany to develop this pipeline also, Nord Stream 2 pipeline, and also because many of the scholars feel that now with the Shell Energy and uh, US wants to supply gas directly to European countries. So if Russia does not supply the benefit, uh, the two countries which will get the maximum benefit, one is of course uh, United States and also the second comes China. 
So United States also thought in terms of economic benefit uh, by escalating a little bit of crisis. Of course, I don't think United States wants to go for a, a world war kind of, want to create a world war kind of situation, but some kind of escalation is uh, beneficial for United States because of NATO and because of the pipeline. Now this pipeline has been canceled, let me tell you. So uh, uh, what, were the Russia, what were Russia's demand from the West? Uh, there were three primary demands. Uh, one was that NATO will not expand, uh, Ukraine will not be included, that, that was number one. Uh, the second one, uh, Russia demanded that the missiles which have been installed in Poland, Romania, etc., by NATO, so those missiles would be withdrawn uh, because that is uh, that will uh, that threatens the security of Russia. So that was second demand. The third was that NATO will remove its troops uh, from uh, from uh, you know uh, from uh, Roma, Poland, Poland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, etc., the boarding states. So those were three demands put forward by Russia before NATO. Uh, just before the crisis started, uh, unfortunately, you know, and let me tell you that Russia would have agreed for agreed for just if the NATO had agreed that uh, that Ukraine will not become the member of uh, NATO. So even with one demand, probably uh, if that de uh, West had acceded to the demand, Russia would have been satisfied. But the West was finding it difficult to accept, and especially after the debacle in Afghanistan, United States and Biden administration would never have accepted that demand. So as a consequence, what you see. Uh, is uh, you know uh, the crisis escalated and this conflict has started. Now, finally, uh, the two. Uh, um, uh, I'll take just two three minutes and I'll finish my presentation here. Uh, so, what is Putin's grand strategy? Uh, if you follow the Western media, or if you follow CNN, or if you follow Western, uh, you know the BBC and other uh, media. Uh, so, uh, this uh, there are three primary hypotheses. मतलब तीन plan है रशिया के उनके हिसाब से मतलब जो हम सोच पा रहे हैं तो तीन hypotheses है एक तो यह है कि उन कुछ लोगों का मानना है कि रूस जो है वो एक तरह से यूएसएसआर जो सोवियत यूनियन था उसको रिक्रिएट करने की कोशिश कर रहा है दूसरा कुछ लोग यह भी बोलते हैं कि रूस यूएसएसआर को क्रिएट करने की कोशिश नहीं कर रहा है रूस जारिस रशा जो कि 1917 से पहले का रशा था उसको क्रिएट करने यानी जारिस रशा को हीज अ जार एंड ही इज ट्राइंग टू क्रिएट अ काइंड ऑफ दैट काइंड ऑफ रशा जारिस रशा तो ये एक हाइपोथेसिस है जो कि काफी पॉपुलर है वेस्टर्न कंट्रीज वेस्टर्न लिटरेचर अगर आप देखेंगे तो आपको लगेगा कि ऐसा ही हो रहा है आ, लेकिन मेरे हिसाब से जो ज्यादा उचित लगता है और जो मेरे हिसाब से लगता है कि रशिया करने की कोशिश कर रहा है तो वो अपनी सिक्योरिटी जो है आ, वो वहां पे रीस्टेब्लिश करने की कोशिश कर रहा है आ, उन सारे स्लाविक कंट्रीज में जिसकी मैंने बात की जिसमें कि यूक्रेन आता है बेलारूस आता है और फिर उसमें रूस आता है ये तीन जो कोर स्लाविक स्टेट है वहां पे वो वेस्टर्न इंटरफेरेंस नहीं चाहता है और मुझे लगता है कि कीव की जो घेराबंदी की जा रही है उसका एक मुख्य मकसद यह है कि वो रूस वहां पे चाहता है कि वहां पे जो रेजीम हो या जो भी वहां पे वहां पे दूसरा गवर्नमेंट बने उस मतलब इसको तो टॉपल करना चाहता है इसको वहां पे दूसरा गवर्नमेंट लाने की कोशिश जरूर करेगा क्योंकि अगर जेलेंस्की इसकी बात को नहीं मानते हैं कि परमानेंटली नेटो मेंबर नहीं बनेगा तो रूस वापस नहीं आने वाला है मेरे हिसाब से और रूस को लगता है कि उसको एक तरह से बफर स्टेट के रूप में यूज कर सकता है या फिर वहां पे अपनी आर्मी को लंबे टाइम तक भी रख सकता है तो ये कहना भी मुश्किल है कि उसकी क्या एग्जैक्ट स्ट्रेटजी है लेकिन हाँ अभी का रेजीम जो है चूंकि जेलेंस की बोल रहे हैं कि उनको काफी सपोर्ट है नेटो को वो बोल रहे हैं कि उनको लोगों का सपोर्ट है तो मुझे लगता है कि उस वैसी स्थिति में वहां पर कंफ्लिक्ट अभी लंबे चलने की संभावना है और जो एक थर्ड तो तीसरी जो हाइपोथेसिस है जो कि रूस में बहुत पॉपुलर है रूस में लोगों का मानना है कि क्यों आखिर ऐसा कर रहा है तो वेस्टर्न वाले तो मैंने बताया कि वो चाहते उनका मानना है कि यूएसएसआर क्रिएट कर रहा है या जारिस रशा जो मोर रैशनल है कि मुझे लगता है कि वो रिजीम चेंज करने की कोशिश करेंगे और अपना एक अपने फेवरेबल गवर्नमेंट वहां पर बिठाने की कोशिश करेंगे जो दो जैसे कि यानोकोविस के टाइम पे था और तीसरी बात जो कि रशिया में पॉपुलर है जैसे मैंने बताया कि वो मानते हैं रूसी लोग जाते मानते हैं कि नेटो को रोकना जरूरी है और नेटो को रोकने के लिए इन्वेजन भी जरूरी है और यहाँ तक कि जो ऑर्थोडॉक्स क्रिस्टानिटी के जो हेड होते हैं मॉस्को में जो पेट्रियाक बोलते हैं उसको वो उनका नाम किरिल है किरिल ने भी बोला है कि वहां पे कि ये जो इन्वेजन है वो जस्टिफाइड है तो इस ढंग का जो पॉपुलर सेंटिमेंट है वो उसको सपोर्ट करता है जो सर्वेज है रूस में वहां पे सेवेंटी परसेंट लोग लगभग वहां पे इस जो इन्वेजन है उसको सपोर्ट करते हैं यूक्रेनियन सॉवरेंटी यहाँ पे एक तरह से बलि का बकरा बन गया है और जो जो एक उनकी जो एक डेवलपमेंट का प्रोसेस चल रहा था या जो उनका जो एक सॉवरेन स्टेटस था अभी के टाइम में मुझे नहीं लगता है कि वो 
रह पाएगा क्योंकि या तो वो रशा के दबाव में रहेंगे जिसकी संभावना ज्यादा है और अगर रशा वहां से विद्रॉ भी करता है तो फिर वो या तो न्यूट्रल पॉलिसी रखेंगे क्योंकि न्यूट्रल जब तक नहीं रखेंगे तब तक रूस नहीं मानेगा और नहीं तो फिर अगर नेटो का प्रभाव बढ़ता है फ्यूचर में तो फिर नेटो के इन्फ्लुएंस में रहेगा तो सबसे जो खतरनाक बात है कि कि सबसे जो दुखद बात है कि वहां के जो बिल्कुल इनोसेंट जो सिटीजन हैं सिविलियंस हैं वो काफी सफर कर रहे हैं उनको लगभग 25 लाख लोग वहां से बाहर जा चुके हैं वो रिफ्यूजी का स्टेटस है लकीली यूरोप ने तो रिफ्यूजी को लिया है लेकिन कब तक रखेगा और वहां पे किस ढंग का क्राइसिस होता है ये बहुत ही मुश्किल होने वाला है तो, तो वहां पर फाइनली मैं इंडिया का पोजिशन एक मिनट में बता दूंगा उसके बाद में खत्म करता हूँ कि इंडिया की पॉलिसी आप जानते हैं कि इंडिया हैज ट्राई टू मेंटेन अ न्यूट्रल काइंड ऑफ पॉलिसी इंडिया ने एब्सटेन किया है यूनाइटेड नेशन सिक्योरिटी काउंसिल में या एटॉमिक एनर्जी में uh, की जो मीटिंग हुई थी या दूसरे जगह पे जनरल असेंबली की जो यूनाइटेड नेशन में मीटिंग हुई थी सारे जगहों पे इंडिया ने एक तरह से uh, ये uh, रशा को कंडेम नहीं किया इस इंडिया के जो वर्डिंग्स भी हैं उसमें इन्वेजन वर्ड आक्रमण यूज नहीं हुआ है तो रशिया बहुत ही इंडिया बहुत ही केयरफुली प्ले कर रहा है क्योंकि आप जानते हैं कि इंडिया तीनों देश जो इन्वॉल्व हैं यानी चार एक्टर्स जो इन्वॉल्व हैं यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स का भी फ्रेंड है इंडिया यूरोपियन कंट्री से हमारे अच्छे रिलेशन है यूक्रेन से भी फॉर्चुनेटली हमारे अच्छे रिलेशन है और रशिया के साथ हमारा हिस्टोरिक डिफेंस और बहुत सारे स्ट्रॉन्ग टाइज है तो इन कारणों से इंडिया हैज मेंटेन्ड अ वेरी बैलेंस्ड काइंड ऑफ पॉलिसी एंड इन माय व्यू इट इज अ वेरी जस्टिफाइड पोजिशन इंडिया हैज डन रीजनेबली वेल इन टर्म्स ऑफ यू नो हैविंग अ बैलेंस्ड पॉलिसी इन मेंटेनिंग स्टाइल्स ऑल्सो विथ यूक्रेन अपार्ट फ्रॉम यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स एंड एंड रशिया so uh, uh, our defense uh, our defense purchase as you know that it comes even today 60 to 70% it comes from uh, from russia uh, and we cannot ignore that and russia plays very important role uh, in the in afghanistan iran central asia uh, uh, on the issue of border conflict with china etc so uh, we have to be very very careful because our core interests are also continental इंडिया के जो हम हम कॉन्टिनेंटल पार हमारे कॉन्फ्लिक्ट जो ज्यादातर भी होते हैं वो चीन के साथ और पाकिस्तान के साथ होते हैं अगर रूस उन देशों को सपोर्ट करना ओपनली शुरू कर दिया तो भारत की मुसीबतें बढ़ जाएंगी और, और दूसरी मजबूरी यह है कि जो चाइना के साथ जो मेरी टाइम सिक्योरिटी एग्रीमेंट है उसमें हमारा यूएस के साथ बड़ा अच्छा रिलेशन है क्वाड एग्रीमेंट हमारा तो इंडिया हैज टू मेंटेन ए बैलेंस्ड पॉलिसी पॉलिसी एंड इन माई व्यू इज अ वेरी जस्टिफाइड पोजिशन सो आई थिंक यू नो आई एल स्टॉप इट हियर एंड आई बी हैप्पी टू टेक क्वेश्चन Uh, that you might have uh, so uh, thank you everybody for listening to me and i hope i didn't exceed my time i was not keeping a lot of time but thank you so much uh, uh, everybody and i hope uh, i did uh, a good job thank yeah, you yeah you did a fantastic job rajan thank you very much and i am sure the presentation was very lucid very brief very succinct uh, very to the point and it actually brought out a lot of uh, questions that people uh, uh, may uh, have had i think i've lost rajan rajan i think uh, while uh, sharing your screen you probably disappeared i'll request the back end team to bring him back uh, uh, please call him and get him back on on the stage for us because he seems to have disappeared from the stage um, so we will have to wait but i will just uh, uh, you know while we are we are requesting rajan to join back again uh some very interesting things have happened and i will just speak about that uh, a little bit uh, just give me a minute uh, so that i can ask him to join back again uh just give me a minute everyone because we didn't expect that he will leave us yes so uh, uh while rajan is joining us there's some very interesting uh, uh you know this this entire discussion has happened in very interesting circumstances we've heard uh, uh rajan's presentation on what russia thinks what the west thinks and i'm going to ask him uh to tell us what ukraine thinks of uh, the west so we have rajan i'll just rajan you yeah. just disappeared i think while uh, uh, yeah some, something happened and yeah yeah Uh, back, yeah. absolutely okay so uh, rajan uh, we are very grateful for your presentation and in your presentation you've actually taken us down through ages of humiliation right from the you know feudal empire that we had in after 1907 uh, uh, you know the the communist regimes that came into place how uh, how russia became the russian empire became ussr and then uh the soviet union disintegrated and became what it is today and further disintegration i think that's how the wheel of history moves but your presentation has focused on the russian view of the whole situation of ukraine and probably the western view 
I would like to begin by asking you, can you also throw some light on how the Ukrainians feel about Russia and how the Ukrainians feel about their strategic location in uh, in Europe, in West? How do they see themselves, uh, the current regime, basically? How do the people see it? And what, what do the Ukrainians want apart from just joining? What is their identity crisis? Speak a little bit about that, please. Yeah, uh, thank you. That's a very, very interesting question, uh, Mugda. And uh, I feel really, really sorry because, you know, Ukraine as a state, as a nation state, uh, at the moment appears completely divided. Uh, when you ask me uh, what Ukrainian thinks, uh, th there can be several answers to that, uh, depending on what you consider to be Ukraine today. Uh, from the, if you take just the Western Ukrainian side, so most of the people there, and when the political parties that win uh, from that region, the Western part of Ukraine, so they want to join NATO. Majority of the people in that region, uh, they want to join NATO. They want to become uh, the part of the European Union, uh, if the European Union is willing to give the membership. Uh, but unfortunately, neither NATO nor the nor the European Union, they are offering membership to Ukraine. So uh, they are also trying to play a proxy kind of game, uh, un Ukraine. Uh, the kind of support that Ukraine expected, uh, they probably thought that uh, United States and the NATO countries will give more supplies to Ukraine so that is also not happening so uh, but Ukrainian people if I say again the second point that you know if I talk about the Ukrainian people in the eastern part of Ukraine where the Donbas region is uh, located so in that region in uh, Luhansk and Donetsk these are the two areas where majority of the people are Russian so uh, they uh, want to uh, get closer to Russia and they want to uh, either become independent or you know uh, uh, be uh, in good books or good terms with russia so uh, ukrainian uh, population as a large uh, is divided but yes uh, putin's invasion in my view uh, it has created a kind of a strong reaction towards uh, even the people who are otherwise neutral uh, many of the people now in ukraine think that what russia is doing it cannot be justified uh, it's not a just war uh, so many of the people who are otherwise you know very uh, neutral they would not have taken the side uh, from either side so now they do not like the invasion which has come from uh, from russia and in my view if you want to fight uh, against nato uh, why uh, why don't fight against nato if, if at all if, if your conflict is with the nato ukraine should not be used either by russia or by NATO. So Ukraine has become a scapegoat. Ye bali ka bakra ban gaya hai. Aur Ukraine uh, dono ke beech mein fas gaya hai. Aur uh, mujhe lagta hai ki agar uh, honest census hota, uh, ek uh, survey hota, to mujhe lagta hai ki abhi ke samay mein jo log hai wahan pe, majority chahte ki unko, uh, kyunki invasion se wo dukhi ho chuke hai, to unko lagta hai ki hume NATO ka member banna chahiye. Halaki yalak baat hai ki NATO unko member nahi banane ja raha hai. Aur nahi European Union unko member banane ja raha hai. So uh, it's very very divided mukda on the issue of uh, uh, where do people uh, stay? But yes, the, now the state of state and sovereignty of Ukraine is under uh, crisis. You know what you see is a balkanization. What balkanization? What you see is more like you know situation what we saw uh, in Afghanistan, where uh, you know the, the, the this uh, proxy war kind of situation might continue. Uh, even if the regime is toppled, the new regime comes uh, supported by Russia. So it's very likely that NATO will keep supplying. Uh, you know, uh, arms and weapons and support uh, to the people who would be fighting against that kind of regime. So Ukraine, you, we are, you are going to witness a very long civil war kind of situation uh, in Ukraine, irrespective of which regime is in power, Zelensky or post Zelensky. So that kind of that's what I see in the next few years. Yeah. So uh, uh, what you also spoke in your presentation, Rajan, was about identity crises, you know, on both sides. And I think it's it's uh, imagined fear on both sides that is led to this, you know, because I think the way the West, what is what is very evident for the lay person probably are, is not so evident to uh, uh, the people who are at the helm of power. Uh, you know, some time back we, when we were in school and college, uh, Francis Foucault, uh, uh, you know, Samuel Huntington wrote about the clash of civilizations, you know. Francis Fukuyama has recently written a book on identity and he talks of the Nietzsche's last man and the problem of thymos, which basically says that the soul wants deep recognition. The soul has the uh, you know, craving for deep recognition. Amy Chuha writes about the fact that uh, US and she mentioned seven other states where she is, countries where US was not, US as a democracy was not able to see uh, in the wars that it entered into Vietnam and Korea and so many other theaters that it's identity the identity and it's mostly 
the racial and the ethnic identity which is at the root which is the basic instinct of man who has this tribal instinct of you know gathering also the fact that you know identity in a way is a double edged sword which has the power to unite and also has the power to exclude so i think that is also happening in the in the theater but my question to you with that background is that we are talking of three ends in this whole thing nato of course you have spoken about in detail what about the nuclearization um uh, do you think russia would have had the same kind of power if ukraine had not given up on its uh, 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 you know nuclear status that is one question the other thing that we hear in the news is denazification with zelensky being a jew um talk about the other two ends which you've probably not touched uh, the fate wh what is it about the nuclear thing what is the agenda uh, uh, that is driving people and what is this whole concept of denazification because any which ways uh, uh, you know germany is not supporting the entry uh, of ukraine into nato neither is france nor is turkey uh, please talk about these other two ends uh, uh, in you, the thank you uh, uh, three points, uh, Mukda. Uh, uh, the first assumption that you made uh, from uh, Samuel Huntington, class of civilization. In fact, uh, this what is happening in Ukraine that punctures the theory of class of civilization, uh, because it punctures the theory. Because the theory said that the uh, the, the future conflicts would be based on cultural fault lines, and he. I, he identified he identified cultural fault lines as you know Islamic versus Christianity and uh, Christianity versus uh, Confucianism. So what is happening is internal conflict within Christianity. All right. So it doesn't support that uh, theory at all. But anyway, the important question that you asked uh, was uh, denuclearization, de denazification. What does Russia mean by it? Uh, mm -hmm. Russia, you know, if I have to take the official view of Russia, so what they mean, what they think that the Zelensky's regime is a regime. Uh, like Nazis, Nazis, and uh, that because you know uh, uh, he is getting a lot of support uh, from the Western countries uh, is hyper nationalism, uh, and uh, and uh, he is also oppressive uh, to some extent towards the Russian linguistic minority. Uh, so all the, because of all these reasons, uh, Russia says that this is Russia has to denazify Ukraine. And uh, by uh, demilitarization, he means that uh, it has to kind of cripple the military installations in different parts of Ukraine. Uh, but let me tell you that I think that is more like a pretext of war rather than the reality. Uh, if na Nazis were ruling in Ukraine, uh, I do not think uh, that Germany would be supporting that regime. And also, do not forget that do not forget that uh, the ruler Zelensky is a Jewish. Uh, his mm -hmm. grandfathers, yes, his grandfathers uh, fought in Soviet army, Red Army, against. Mm -hmm. Nazi against Hitler, so mm -hmm. I know, uh, so I do not buy that official argument of uh, Moscow, where uh, mm -hmm. they argue that you know it's a kind of war against Nazi and all. So that is not the case. Yes, mm -hmm. it it was a discriminatory towards the Russian population. That's that's a fact, but it's not a Nazi regime at all. Uh, as far as the second question of uh, nuclear uh, Ukraine is concerned, considered whether that could have worked as deterrent. That's a that's 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 a very valid question. And in my view, in my view. Uh, that definitely would have worked as uh, a nuclear that, as a deterrent because you do not attack a nuclear country because of the threats that you have. Uh, all these countries in, in 1994, uh, the agreement, the the agreement that happened, a Budapest Agreement and the other agreements also, Russia and the Western countries both promised that they will ensure the security of Ukraine uh, and uh, they will also provide some funds and uh, grants also to Ukraine. Uh, if they decide to uh, to uh, kind of you know get rid of that nuclear weapons, Ukraine did it. But unfortunately, what is happening today that neither the kind of protection that is it, it expected from NATO that is not happening, and uh, uh, Russia is uh, Russia has invaded Ukraine. Uh, so uh, you know, uh, nuclear deterrent uh, it, it could have worked. It has not worked, and sanctions uh, cannot be the nuclear deterrent. No matter how much of sanctions you can put in, Iran survived the sanctions, and most of the regimes uh, in the world they have survived the sanctions for several decades. So, sanctions, economic, commercial interest, they never worked as uh, nuclear deterrent. But yes, uh, nuclear case would have been different. You are right. Thank you. So we'll talk about sanctions also, Rajan, because Yogesh has also asked a question on sanctions. But I'll just like you to hold on to that thought a little bit, where we are talking about identity, and it's still not completely done with that question. Uh, you know, uh, it is increasingly being believed that democracy with gross inequality is incompatible with universal brotherhood, which basically means that the social fabric gets torn. And we are aware that 
uh, uh, that in Russian Russia's own economy, uh, uh, only 10% uh, people are very, very rich and the rest 90% so are very, very poor, uh, are not able to maintain an average lifestyle. And I have had some uh, you know, uh, personal uh, eyewitness stories of having traveled in, in Russia some, uh, some 10 years back and seen the kind of opulence that exists in a few and and spoken to a few people so tell me uh, something which is which is of interest to me and this is also a universal template uh, because putin also himself uh, you know extended his uh, tenure as president very recently uh, so there was some there there is some mastermind game planning which already existed in his in his uh, uh, scheme of things probably and i want you to answer that question because in a democratic setup, it becomes very difficult to hold on to things when your economy is nose diving, right? And there are economic interests involved in this whole scheme of things. The universal template, and my question to you is this, that increasingly we are seeing that be it China, uh, be it uh, countries elsewhere, we had a Trump regime in, in US, uh, USA just before uh, Joe Biden's uh, term. We are also seeing it in several other countries around the world. I don't want to mention all countries by name, but we, we are aware. Th this increasing, you know, uh, uh, wanting the craving to glorify the past, to validate the existence of the country. Uh, because you, you are not very comfortable. This is the land of social media. Russia has been doing this, uh, be it data manipulation, uh, the Steve Bannon case we have seen, uh, you know, so right now interference in each other's countries is not just military interference. It's also having puppet regimes installed. China has done it in a different manner by investing monies. Russia has done through data manipulation. Uh, we have seen um, Chris Weile and everybody. So talk a little bit about this urge to go back to the past glorification of the ancient past as a veil to what to to cover what is happening the crisis the crisis that is happening in the country itself unemployment uh, economic uh, poverty uh, your own people not very happy with the regime so you extend your tenure become president for life and then you start thinking with things around so so maybe joe biden is doing the same uh, because he wants to divert attention from what is happening in us putin is doing the same because he wants to avert attention from what is happening in his own country speak a little about that uh, thank you. Uh, this uh, this debate is very very important, and you raised a very good question of uh, glorification, glorifying the past. You know, uh, um, our, our argument goes uh, that you know Russia is trying to uh, re-establish the glory of uh, of the past. Uh, now, uh, in my view, uh, the way I understand Russian history and culture, uh, remember that there is no unanimity, there is no consensus on which past to glorify in Russia, even today. Uh, uh, Putin uh, has said that uh, the, you know that was a catastrophe. The disintegration of the Soviet Union was a catastrophe, but at the same time, Putin has also been critical of many of the policies of the Soviet Union. So, when you say uh, uh, a glory of the past, are you talking about Gorbachev? Uh, are you talking about Stalin? Are you talking about the ideologically committed Lenin? Uh, are you talking about the Tsar? And Jars are also of different varieties. Uh, some were just puppets, and some were very weak, and some were like Peter the Great. So you know the the com comparison which is being made by a lot of people, uh, especially coming from the Western media, and uh, so they say that you know he is trying to create the Jarism or, or the Jarist Empire, all right. Mm -hmm. uh, but but my point is you know the Jarist Empire also disintegrated. So why do you want to create that kind of system? Uh, Putin knows about it. Uh, mm -hmm. He uh, uh, he also some of the people also argue that you know he wants to become the Peter the Great because Peter the Great who established Saint Petersburg and you have been to Saint Petersburg I know. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, so uh, he. Uh, wants to create that kind of system. So I think, you know, uh, uh, my view is that Putin is aware of the fact that he cannot create the Tsarist empire. Uh, he cannot create even the Soviet Union. Uh, why? Uh, because the world has completely changed. And do, uh, some of the people, uh, you know, treat uh, uh, President Putin as a crazy person who is going to take all the territories of the uh, of the post with the state but in my view that is not the case in my view what he's trying to do uh, is because the, i told you that there is a security dilemma and security is an issue of perception it's not about the real threat and the real security real threat uh, threat and security is a is a very imaginary kind of concept it doesn't exist but if you have the security dilemma when you fear that nato is going to contain you nato is going to 
uh, invade you. It might take away the territories which are very productive, the oil field and gas field, etc. So then you try to ensure a boundary uh, which uh, which which is uh, which is, which can ensure the security of Russia as a state. So in my view, Russia is uh, concerned primarily about halting the expansion of NATO. Uh, Russia is a uh, second motive of Russia is to play a bigger role in European security architecture, uh, where you know uh, it can have a good relation with Germany, uh, Fr France, uh, Italy also. Uh, and uh, it would like many of the countries to remain neutral. For instance, you know, not every European country is European Union country is a member of NATO. Austria is a neutral state. Austria is not a member of NATO. Uh, Finland is not a member of NATO. Sweden is not a member of NATO. Uh, so these are the states. So Russia would uh, prefer a kind of, uh, you know, uh, a role uh, in the broader uh, European security architecture. That's for, that's uh, a fact. Russia would also Russia also wanted to revive its economy, but now for the next. Uh, 10, 15 years, I think it would be very, very difficult. And by the time it uh, establishes a relationship with uh, uh, with uh, with uh, China, so that will take time. But remember that the reason why Putin cannot revive either Jarism or uh, Soviet Union, because other powers have become important. The world has become multipolar. World is not bipolar, remember. And world is not the monarchies of the Jarist period. So uh, China has become important. Do you think uh, you know, China will allow uh, Russia to have influence in Southeast Asia or in uh, on Korea? Uh, it's very very difficult. India will not allow in South Asia. Uh, uh, this uh, this uh, Brazil will not allow in Latin America, and then Africa is again divided. So uh, what I think in Africa, out of 34 countries or something, seven I think 40 or odd countries, 13, 17 countries voted or abstained in favor of uh, Russia. So uh, so I know the world is very divided, and I do not think uh, Putin is uh, so. Uh, uh, so foolish that he can think of reviving either the Soviet Union or or the Jarist Empire. Uh, coming to your question of inequality and democracy, uh, remember that you know the narrative is important. How you and uh, Russian uh, media is very very controlled by the state, uh, especially the electronic media. So the narrative that people are getting is very very different from the narrative that we get in India or from the West. Uh, and other places. Uh, so it's a totally different and narrative is controlled by the state. In all the authoritarian state, the narrative is always controlled by the state and that's exactly the case in uh, Russia also. And per capita income and inequality, I think not, that is not linked to uh, a democracy. Uh, that, there is a theory that you know you have to have minimum per capita income to have democracy. I don't think India uh, in, it was a very uh, it was, it was a developing country in the 40s, 50s, 60s, but still we remain democracy. Uh, th so. Uh, Inequality is there. You are absolutely right. And uh, oligarch, as I told you, that they became very powerful, and only those oligarchs survived, uh, which got the patronage of Putin. So many of them, like Khodorovsky and all, uh, who was the head of Yukos Oil, famous oil. So he has been jailed also. And people were very unhappy because of these oligarchs. And unfortunately, these oligarchs get support from uh, the Western states, and they think that you know these are the people who can be, uh, who can lead some kind of socialist, uh, some kind of you know civil society uh, change in Russia. So I, I, I think I'll stop it here. Yeah, you can ask me the next one. So my question about inequality was that if inequality exists in democracy, it becomes very difficult to hold the social fiber together, and you are bound to have dissensions. Uh, it was not whether with inequality you can't have democracy. So just a correction on my observation. Uh, mm -hmm. But talking of the primordial need, you know, I uh, somehow feel, uh, and of course I would want to be stand corrected by the expert, but I feel that sometimes the unpredictability born out of fear, a very psychological thing I'm talking of right now, and we know Russia has played psychological warfare earlier also. Uh, uh, so what looks as unpredictability to me could also look as a strategic uh, uh, you know dimension to the world uh, is what i'm trying to say but my question is that uh, you know when we look at europe uh, uh, you know from europe's perspective we have seen that this whole uh, you know experiment that europe tried with the european union 2015 onwards the fabric has been kind of uh, you know, disintegrating in many ways. The way that it was assumed uh, has not worked. We had a Brexit very recently, and we've now seen that the Eastern Europe is actually, uh, you know, disintegrating, has, you know, come together, gone back. And this is also a template of history. So it is nothing new that is happening in contemporary times. Europe has seen that many times over, beginning from the Vikings and uh, down to the Roman Catholic Habsburg Empire, the Moors uh, on the Western side. So all this has been happening of late. Uh, but my question is that, you know, culturally, uh, 
the Russia that I have known as a child uh, was through the law, through the propaganda that happened through the books that we read in the market. Uh, right. And we have seen, uh, we did a presentation on China recently, and we see how China is using social media, culture, setting up the Confucius Institutes, using culture to improve its image in the Western, uh, you know, in the Western market, uh, uh, you know, trying to, uh, you know, intellectually find a strategic footing uh, with war. I don't know uh, whether that aim can be fulfilled, but talk a little about what uh, the mastermind master stroke with regard to culture is which about which we know very little because culture is a very very important tool of uh, you know uh, trying to trying to set your reputation right in the western market uh, obtaining leadership obtaining support what is russia doing is russia doing anything with respect to that apart from the war that it is uh, uh, you know, led to uh, uh, recently. Talk a little about the cultural influences and uh, as an instrument of uh, reimagining Russia. And also, when I spoke of the past, uh, you know, it's like the Benedict Anderson's past. You know, imagined past. You can imagine. So there is everything for everybody. You, if you are a believer in the Zazist, you can think that okay, it's the Zazist revival which is happening. If you are a person which holds the communist thing, so it's like keeping it vague. But referring, keep referring to the past. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mukda. Uh, imagining is fine, but imagining has to stand uh, on the reality. <laughs> Otherwise, imagination becomes just a dream. Uh, so, Manu, uh, coming to the point of cultural war, uh, cultural uh, context, let me tell you that you know every nation state uh, would de defines uh, you know according to some kind of cultural exceptionalism. Uh, in the case of Russia, the, that cultural exceptionalism is, of course, the language. Uh, mm -hmm. But also, but also the you know the Orthodox Christianity. At least Putin, uh, President Putin, uh, he does define Russian identity in terms of uh, uh, this uh, this uh, Orthodox Christianity. And Orthodox Christianity, as uh, you know, uh, I uh, as you know that uh, there are three uh, heads, patriarchs. One is the you know the Vatican, Vatican mm -hmm. patriarch, Vatican uh, that Pope Francis that you have. Uh, the second one is the the uh, ecumenical, which is in uh, located in that uh, uh, Istanbul, which was part of Constantinople, and the mm -hmm. third one is the Moscow Patriarch. Uh, Moscow mm -hmm. Patriarch and the head of the Moscow Patriarch is uh, Kirill, is the name at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. So he, uh, in fact, is very interesting. I, I'll share the article with you, which what I read in New Yorker. Uh, so uh, what he says is very interesting. He says that this invasion is justified uh, because we cannot allow. The, the 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 you know the gays are to parade the way they do it in the west all right mm -hmm. so they fear that you know the gay lesbian etc so they fear that the west is degenerated and if the western influence comes to russia or ukraine those kind of values will come and uh, this orthodox christianity will get, get compromised some of the things that we hear in india also and many other uh, developing countries so uh, so uh, coming back to so kirill uh, that patriarch Mos moscow patriarch uh, he justified this war and he is the only one out of three patriarchs that I told you that one in Istanbul, one in uh, Vatican. Vatican has taken the neutrality. The, the Vatican mm -hmm. follows the policy of neutrality. He will not say anything against uh, this thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, Vatican is also separated uh, from uh, this uh, the Moscow patriarch. Uh, mm -hmm. But Moscow patriarch says that it's a just war and we need to check the Western influence. So he's not defining as a uh, economic influence or the diplomatic influence over Ukraine. He is defining this war as a cultural war. And uh, because mm -hmm. in the post uh, this after the disintegration of the Soviet Union, uh, that Orthodox Christianity as a religion, because there was no church worship and all. It was a very hidden act during the Soviet period. Many of the churches were destroyed also. But it, you know, it emerged uh, with vengeance in the post-Soviet state. All the states, not just in Russia, but post-Soviet states. So they define or they take Orthodox Christianity very, very seriously. And one of the reasons many people believe that why Putin is very concerned about Belarus and Russia, Belarus and Ukraine, because Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine, they have the common origin, they follow the same culture, uh, the language is also identifiable uh, from the same root. The origin is Kievan Rus. Uh, so these are the ways uh, through which Russia defines its cultural exceptionalism. But identity of Russia is also defined in terms of, as I told you, uh, westernizers, Slavophile, and Eurasianism. So westernizers, the people, they think that you know Russia should become the part of the West. 
but mm-hmm. dostoevsky once said that if you cannot become the the, uh, the master in the west so it's better to become the the, the master in the east so you know mm-hmm. those kind of uh, feelings are there that if west do not accept, west does not accept you so let's go to east uh, so we will be the master of the east uh, because you know we are industrialized and better than the east. so that's that feeling is there among the russian but there are people who, uh, who also identify and themselves as slavophile because of the slavic identity and uh, mm-hmm. in Slav- slavophile the, apart from these three countries belarus ukraine and russia the, the serbia you know which was yugoslavia etc so that is also a kind of a slavic uh, route so many of the states in eastern europe they identify as slavic but eastern slav is actually these three states so that gives another cultural aspect of uh, this russian identity so uh, so these are the things that which are exceptional in the case of uh, russia and uh, if you want to ask me yeah, uh, please please do no. so i thank you so much uh, rajan we really enjoyed your presentation i'll now be switching over to the audience question and we have a uh, a bouquet of questions directed at you and there's this gentleman who has joined us from istanbul really grateful and he wants to know erhan is his name if i'm pronouncing it right can we say that russian interest is personified in the person of putin who else define or endorse russian interests uh erhan dogan uh, thank you so much for asking this question is a friend of mine in istanbul and turkey is a major player Uh, turkey mm-hmm. is a major player in this uh, last meeting of foreign minister actually took place in turkey and turkey mm-hmm. also has close links with ukraine because of trade and other other things a lot of people from russia and uh, ukraine they go to turkey uh, for uh, this uh, tourist uh, this uh, in the in the black sea area so uh, mm-hmm. anyway uh, so uh, the question was uh, that uh, putin does putin identify the national interest of russia uh, ideally yeah. the uh, Uh, the russian interest is personified in the person of putin yeah 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 so i get it yeah. so in my view uh, you know uh, when you have a system which is very strictly authoritarian uh, th- uh, you uh, do not really rep- uh, the leader does not really represent the interest of the national interest Na- what you call uh, it does not pers- personify the national interest but what the message goes from the state to the people the other way around top to bottom the message goes that he what he is doing is for the national interest in my view even today if you take a survey in russia most of the people in russia are against the war they do not want this war to happen because they are the ones who are going to suffer but uh, the you know entire discourse narrative is being projected in a way that russia will not survive the threat uh, russia as a state will be uh, under threat if uh, russia allowed ukraine to become the member of nato so uh, national interest definitely cannot be pers- personified by one leader but the way national interest is projected in the uh, narrative the dominant narrative of the state so putin is very effectively doing that and people are convinced that you know uh, NAT- not nato has to be halted uh, for the interest of russia so that was my yeah. answer yeah thank you so much uh, we i'm going to ask you three questions uh, because they all have economics at the core of what they are asking and i will begin by asking a question from my team member joshi yogesh he says the ukraine is definitely suffering but somewhere this war is also impacted impacting russia economically many major brands like apple microsoft samsung stopped operations in russia even the worldwide payment platforms are banned for russia now many countries have imposed sanction on russia private assets of government people outside russia are sealed so that's one question but hold on to it and i have another gentleman called shoaib raza he wants to know how long can europe afford this aggressive nature of russia and its backyard and also whether it would retaliate or not owing to the energy and gas that it receives from russia and the last question in the series is from shaheen ansari a fellow genuite and he says how this war is going to impact india and its economy so three questions and maybe you can talk a little little bit about sanctions uh, in this context yeah so the question the other first question is about economic sanction uh, whether it will impact russia or not uh, in my view it will have a massive impact on russia uh, the, you know the kind of sanctions which have been imposed uh, on uh, russia Uh, so uh, that is going to impact the life of the people now even indian people are going to suffer forget about the russian people uh, so uh, because uh, ma- most many of the investments which were there so they are back backtracking they are withdrawing a uh, ruble uh, within a week of war ruble crashed almost 30% so if you want to go outside or if you want to trade with any other country the the your value has gone down 30% in just one week uh, investment is not uh, down the share market they are not opening because they think that it might crash Uh, the uh, most of the even popular companies like McDonald's and Apple etc. Uh, they have withdrawn from Russia. Uh, 
airlines, the Aeroflot, you know, uh, which uh, we thought we used to think that this is a Russian airline, but because many of the parts are supplied by Boeing and American companies. So now uh, it would be difficult for airline, that airline to survive. So uh, Russia, Russian economy was anyway not doing very well, uh, although Russian uh, agriculture was doing better uh, in the last few years. Uh, military industry was also doing better, but many of the other sectors were not doing so well. Uh, so uh, definitely people are going to suffer and people will economic sanction will impact the life of people. There is absolutely no second question about it. Uh, what uh, the second question of Shoaib uh, is about what Europe uh, can do. Uh, my In my view, what uh, the best thing that Europe can do is to uh, have a ceasefire. Uh, if you, Europe can convince formally or in, informally either Zelensky or Putin that Ukraine is not going to be a member of NATO and we will maintain uh, some kind of balance in the region. So that can lead to a uh, ceasefire uh, in the in, in, in this kind of situation. Although uh, in my view, Putin, uh, you know, uh, because he has invested so much now, uh, now people will question the credibility of the leadership in case he does not achieve uh, something, uh, something good in Ukraine. So uh, Putin is uh, likely to uh, escalate the crisis also, uh, if in case he doesn't achieve the objective. Uh, in, in my view, Europe should put pressure on both the sides and it should lead to ceasefire and it should lead to a uh, resettlement of the people who have become refugees. All of a sudden, 6% of the people have become refugees. And if the war lingers on, the people who are, who are going to suffer are the Ukrainian people. So Ukraine also has to realize that the war is very asymmetrical. You know, uh, you can, can fight, but you cannot fight a, an, an enemy without uh, support, clear support from NATO if the enemy is so powerful and so big. And if the Kyiv is uh, surrounded, is seized, under siege, so how long Kyiv will survive, that is also a question mark. Now, two of the mayors have been uh, abducted, they say, uh, by the Russian army. So many of the leaders would be, uh, you know, under control of Russia, and that will influence the people's opinion also. So, uh, you know, European countries, even India. India, Turkey, Israel, China, you know, they should play a very proactive role because we are suffering uh, because of this crisis. Our uh, oil price has uh, gone up, uh, $30 billion uh, we are going to spend extra on energy because of this crisis. Uh, so uh, inflation has gone up. Rupee has, uh, the value of rupee has also gone down a few rupees in the last few days uh, in comparison to dollar. So uh, all of us are going to suffer. Uh, so we should put pressure on different parties to hold a ceasefire and go for negotiations. Yeah, uh, so thank you very much. And uh, we we have an interesting observation. So Vidya Sarvesan is a professor of English literature uh, at IIT Jodhpur. And she says she, that the famous poem by Lord Tennyson called The Charge of the Light Brigade was dedicated to the Crimean War soldiers. That's just an observation that came. I thought I should thank read you. it out. Thank you. Pavan so Swanaji uh, uh, is a professor, ex-chairperson of the uh, Women's Commission at Jaipur. Uh, she says how to stop war and peace should be regained kindly suggest some possible solutions i'll your time is a little short so i'll read out a few questions you can answer uh, mm, uh, then we have uh, alka aditi saying with ukraine crisis how does it affect the southeast asian region and why haven't they responded to this as yet uh, uh, abbas razvi says uh, seeing how Ukraine wants to join NATO and the European Union, how would that affect the quality of life of the ordinary Ukrainian? Would it also give them more security in the future? Uh, and one question from uh, from Professor Hari Nair from Bitspilani, and he says, in fact, he has quite a few questions, but maybe I can we can take up two questions. What are the reasons for British? Russophobia and what is the rationale for NATO expansion? Is it for commerce of the Western war corporations? Uh, and he thanks you for a brilliant presentation as well. Okay, uh, so let me start with the you know uh, this British uh, uh, phobia of Russia uh, that Professor Harina that asked me in the last question that you read. Uh, so what is the rationale for NATO? Uh, in my view, uh, you know NATO was a decaying institution during the Trump administration because Trump pursued a policy of uh, American isolation. And he has started uh, asking money from Germany and other alliance partners also, Japan, etc. Uh, so uh, people have started thinking that if American isolationist policy continue, he followed economic isolation and also military and uh, this uh, political isolation. Uh, so uh, NATO started feeling uh, threatened. Uh, uh, NATO's legitimacy was under 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 threat under question. Uh, so uh, people start. So Biden administration thought that if uh, you know it has to play an active role in Europe at least, and Europe is the primary region for uh, United States. Please remember, 
US hegemony, hegemony cannot be continued if Europe does not uh, remain the part of American alliance system and American liberal order. So because that was being threatened, so Biden administration sought to revive NATO uh, by you know, giving legitimacy to NATO by a kind of you know, engaging in this kind of crisis also. Uh, so uh, rational for NATO is, uh, in my view, NATO should not have, uh, uh, NATO's security will not increase uh, if it includes either Ukraine or Georgia. All right. Uh, in a state, if Ukraine becomes part of NATO, NATO will be facing a Russian army. So I just fail to understand how NATO will be more secured uh, if uh, if uh, if uh, uh, Ukraine becomes a member. Uh, British uh, security threat uh, is uh, very historic. Also, remember the two countries who which actually uh, fear the most uh, in Europe, Russia. Uh, the two countries which fear Russia are. Uh, one is European uh, Britain and the second one is uh, United States. So they are very, very concerned about the rise of Russia. They think that many of the countries in Europe might take side of Russia, especially Germany, because Germany has very close historical cultural ties with Russia. Marriages of princes and uh, monarchs, etc. It was a very common practice. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, they think that if Germany becomes very powerful and it decides to go with Russia, so that will threaten American influence on. So two of the policies, uh, of United States, one is to keep Russian down, but also uh, German uh, German down in European security uh, architecture. So that's American policy. Uh, British uh, Russophobia is very old uh, in, in 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 Britain. So uh, because of the uh, Jarist region, because uh, also uh, remember that you know in India the British Empire fought three Afghan wars and three Afghan wars against whom against because they thought that Russians are going to come in Afghanistan. So, but that phobia was imperial, that phobia was also because of the Cold War period. So the British phobia is very prominent, very, uh, you know, that the, the Russian phobia is there. Similarly, the British phobia is also there in the Russian mindset. Uh, the question of, uh, you know, Professor Rana, how peace can be established? Uh, that's a very uh, difficult question. And it is beyond my competence. A diplomat would have answered the right, this question in a right way, but I'll make an attempt, uh, ceasefire number one. And then uh, you have to take into account the security interest first of Ukrainian, and then followed by Russia and uh, NATO. So if you take these things into account, uh, some kind of agreement can be reached. And the fact that you know uh, these countries remained uh, in the last three decades, they remained uh, more or less uh, in peace. So it can be established again uh, if uh, that those steps are taken. Uh, the question of Alka that how will it impact the Southeast Asia region? Why are they silent? Uh, in my view, Southeast Asian countries are waiting and watching because, uh, you know, the theater uh, before this war was uh, Southeast Asia and Indo-Pacific, Indo where uh, you, you might have heard that uh, Quad was active and the AUKUS, the alliance of US, uh, Britain and Australia, that took place, AUKUS uh, alliance, military alliance, and uh, Russia, uh, United States thought that probably it would contain China. Uh, so, and Southeast Asian countries are also very small states and divided states. Uh, they have agreement with China, economic uh, agreement, the RCEP, uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, they have with Southeast Asian state, where Japan, China, Australia, etc. are members. Uh, so, they have closed economic ties and now they will fear, the Southeast Asian states, they will fear that if uh, Ukraine cannot be saved by NATO or by the European countries, which actually uh, uh, is the bordering state, so uh, whether America will save Southeast Asia or not. So those questions are there in the mind of Indians. Those questions are there in the mind of Southeast Asia also. So please remember that you know we are witness going to witness a different kind of world order. And I personally believe that China is going to be far more assertive in the Southeast Asia. Southeast Asian countries are silent because uh, like India, they are also divided uh, between China, uh, Japan, uh, United States. So they are divided. Next question is, uh, how will NATO expansion impact the life of uh, uh, Ukrainian. I think, you know, for Ukrainian, I do not think NATO could have led to something, you know, uh, something uh, kind of major change in the lifestyle or per capita income, etc. And NATO could have provided a sense of security, uh, which they enjoyed with different uh, uh, regimes in different historical periods. Uh, but beyond that, I do not see that uh, NATO could have led to major change in the uh, economic. Uh, and uh, NATO would not have, uh, and uh, NATO is not an economic union, it's a military organization. Uh, so uh, I think, you know, in my view, uh, Ukraine could have remained neutral and that was uh, uh, better for Ukraine, uh, Ukraine uh, rather than Ukraine could have taken the benefit from both the sides, like Moldova, for instance, you know, like uh, uh, Austria or and the number of states, Sweden, Finland, which are neutral, which are not part of NATO and they are still secured. Russia is not attacking Sweden, Russia is not attacking Finland also. So, uh, you know, Ukraine, uh, I don't think uh, was going to gain much from NATO. Actually, it has lost. Now, the statehood of Ukraine uh, is uh, totally questionable.
thank you so these were the questions uh, i think from Ulta. yeah uh, thank you professor arjun very very much it was a really very insightful uh, 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 you know discussion um, one would not want it to end because there's still so many questions that one would want you uh, to answer but probably we'll have to do a part two because this looks as per your own observation this uh, looks like it's going to be a long drawn thing and we all know that uh, peace follows war and uh, war uh, happens only because there is a deep insecurity for peace and balance so we will hope that uh, the peace can be established sooner and the people on both sides which are the ones which actually suffer the citizens suffer uh, the citizens uh, can be brought peace on both sides of the border is what we pray from this forum uh, world peace and humanity and universal brotherhood uh, harmony and peace for everyone is our prayers from this platform so thank you very much and i hope uh, uh, the audience has enjoyed this session today at least you've had a very very factful understanding of what is going on of course there will be opinions on uh, all sides but I'm very happy to also tell the audience that please reserve uh, the March of 26th. Uh, we are, as I told you in our earlier sessions, that uh, uh, we have started two new streams in our uh, discussions. One is focused on geopolitics. So we will be getting you more sessions. And we have two more sessions in the same series for people who have joined us only recently. Please subscribe to our Facebook page because it will give you updated information on all our new sessions. You can also follow us on uh, Instagram and LinkedIn and various other places to keep updated. And I'm also very, very happy to tell you that the next session is going to be on Dida, the warrior queen of Kashmir. Um, uh, the reason is that uh, apart from the geopolitics vertical that we have started in which we'll be talking later on uh, on Afghanistan, uh, with experts discussing books and what is happening, a historical background. We will also be taking up Latin America, a region which is very, very important and lesser known to our people. We'll be talking of literature, culture, and a whole lot more because very recently in the budget in Kerala, they've decided to set up a Latin American center, a media of interest to people who are working on Latin America. The other vertical that we have started is celebrating Indian women from historical times. And that was the invite for the next session that we will have on the 26th of March. We will be starting from Kashmir, talking of the warrior queen Dida. She makes for a very, very interesting reading. And I'm sure all our viewers will join me in celebrating the famous women of India, be it historical kings and queens, uh, be it women in literature, be it women in science, uh, so please do join us and uh, and subscribe to our channel. And once again, thank you, Rajan, very, very much for doing this conversation for us and to all our lovely audiences who have joined us tonight, uh, taking out time from a very, very busy and hectic, I'm sure, uh, schedule that most people have on weekends. Uh, so thank you so once my, again. My, my special, my, thank you so much, Mugda, and also Rastan IS Association uh, for giving me this platform and opportunity. Uh, I look forward to doing it again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And Tarika has a question on refugees. Yes, our heart bleeds for refugees everywhere. Uh, and we hope uh, that people who are working uh, to bring peace are able to do it sooner for the sake of the people that are involved, irrespective of what country, what race, what ethnicity they belong to. So thank you, Tarika, for that observation. Uh, good luck and good night. And we'll catch you soon uh, later this month. See you all the best. 21st of March is Poetry World Poetry Day. We are hoping to bring you a session. Uh, 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 so also reserve 21st. So there will be some nice poetry happening to celebrate the World Poetry Day. If not, then that on the 26th, of course, we'll see you for Dida. Thank you once again. Good night. Good evening. All the best. Enjoy yourselves.